really good comment here from the same guy uh, as earlier. And this is a phrase that's going to stick with me for a long time, uh, John. You took my money, give me my cubes. (laughs) (laughs) It's a lot of the same people complaining. You uh, took my money, give me my cubes. A lot of the people around the world were having to pay a bunch of customs fees on the cubes too. Um, So they're getting they're getting hit for like forty dollar customs fees. Um, People are not. (laughs) God, dude, this is from Rax Lancelot. I am still waiting. Please give my cubes to me, please. It's really <laughs> funny that they're cubes. I think. I think the fact that it's cubes makes it a lot yeah. funnier. Um, just but, the, just saying, like, give me my cubes. You know, yeah, is like need, a good. I need you know, my cubes. I need my cubes. I give me my, my cubes. cubes. And then it's really funny. The people who do have cubes uh, really hate the cubes. Like, yes. very few people on here are like these are actually good. Can't drink bubbly water on podcast days. That's the bubbles live inside your gut and they come out at the least opportune moment. That's what bubbles do. Hi, everybody, and welcome to a brand new episode of Lucky Paper Radio. My name is Mr. Body, and I'm hosting this dinner party. I've invited all of my weird esoteric... No, not esoteric. I've invited all of my strange friends over to my house for a nice dinner party in my big fancy mansion, and oops, I ended up dead. Who was it? Could it have possibly been... My co-host, Anthony Professor Plum Maddox. <laughs> I'm just stuck on trying to figure out what word you were trying to say instead of esoteric. Uh, yeah, I also can't figure it out either. I also don't know what P- Professor Plum sounds like. I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not ready to play in the space yet. We gotta, uh, we gotta do some, do a little uh, more character work first. Hold on. I, I esoteric. Um, um, et- I like that you also figured out. You're, that work, I- you're looking for eclectic. Eclectic. Thank you. That's the yeah. word. Welcome to an eclectic podcast with four <sighs> eclectic magic players. I like that you could tell I was trying to think of another word that I failed to think of. Yes, that that is good to me. Um, let me let me read you this description I found of uh, Professor Plum real quick. Okay. Now I want you to want to make it clear. This is not you to a T. This is just the closest to you oh, of no. all of the characters in the game <sighs> Clue. All right, bracing myself to feel judged. Professor Plum is represented by the game's purple token. He would be the smartest man on the planet if he wasn't so scatterbrained. Slightly balding and middle-aged, Peter Plum can't remember where he's been for the last five minutes of any part of any day. So how could he remember if he murdered Mr. Body or not? He's a simple, intelligent man and good-natured at heart, but he likes to steal his own things. That's because he's just (laughs) absent-minded enough to do so. (laughs) You're making this up. (laughs) No, this is courtesy of uh, whatever website did the best job of search engine farming the search phrase clue characters, which is lovetoknow.com. I feel like there Please, should don't, there should be H bomber guy. Don't come after <laughs> there us. There should be a, a Wikipedia page of like a list of incidents of people stealing their own things. I feel like this comes up occasionally, uh, such as um, who is the comedian I'm trying to think of? I don't know because I'm Professor Mr. Plum and I'm too scatterbrained. I can't remember. I'm scatterbrained. Um, who was the the podcast that just did a did a not podcast? Who was the, the comedian that just did a stand up about his uh, drug recovery? John John Mulaney did a bit about stealing his own money because he told his bookkeeper not to let him use his yeah, money for yeah, drugs. Yeah, that was pretty good. So, sure, stealing your own stuff. Here we are. Maybe it wasn't Professor Plum. Maybe it was instead Parker, a.k.a. Mr. Green, Lamascus. Hi, Parker. Howdy. It was not me. Definitely not. It says here on this website that Mr. Green is a smooth talker, and you are just that. Oh, that's so kind of you. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I can talk my way out of this murder investigation. Yeah, I'm not going to read the rest of this description of Mr. Okay, Green. Okay, good. Really not. And none of these really. Honestly, you're both Professor Plum, if we're honest. You're both the, <laughs> the, the nerdy smart gun, so. Mm-hmm. I was going to say, I'm not sure I'm really the smart one, but. As far as us fitting into archetypes, you know, we're all kind of the same, broadly speaking, archetype. Yep. So. Bunch of that's white guys. what we are. Speaking into podcasts. <laughs> speaking into speaking podcasts, into- Anthony? Oof. Um, it's another after work podcast it's record. Another after work Buckle record. up, kids. So, I was actually just listening to a podcast about Clue, totally unrelated, uh, but completely unrelated completely, to magic. Well, yes, yeah. Why? Stuff, the Stuff You Should Know podcast. They just talk about, I mean, you know, it's just two white guys reading a Wikipedia page to you, which is uh, what a podcast is. Um, and it's it got some interesting history to it. I didn't realize, first of all, that it is like, aside from 
classic games like chess and checkers and maybe one or two others go it is like one of the top board games ever so interesting by what measure by what measure I, that's the thing is maybe sales but something like chess is not like a branded thing that can only be sold by one thing so yeah. i don't really know how you measure those but yeah. just, it's top it's it's important it's also interesting Citation that it's been needed. it's been re-released in many different countries many different regions and they always sort of like tweak the characters a little bit so and you know different time periods so at some point it was like reverend green versus mr green and now it's like i don't know TikToker green or whatever to, to appeal to the kids so what we need is actually all of the various local Localized Professor Plums. We need like the you know Arabic market <laughs> yeah, Professor exactly. Plum and the Chinese market <laughs> Professor Plum, and that's actually who we all are. We're just sure, the, yeah. We're just the different Professor Plums. Mm-hmm. Parker, welcome back to the show. We have you on because we are doing yet another set review episode, and there's even more spoilers coming out for other new new products. So I feel like we are hot in spoiler season. Yeah, we're really uh, under the gun here to get the latest set review discussion out before the next one comes up so i'm glad we're doing it now you say we're under the gun and that's a very nice way of saying we are very late <laughs> on this one therefore <laughs> we find ourselves under the gun as the next one approaches but it's been t- it's been hard to find time we got to coordinate a lot of things to get this done and uh, one of the other things we were coordinating for this set specifically is an article from usman jamil who is known for being one of the original cube theorists uh, probably responsible for some of the greatest quantity of cube writing that's ever been posted to the internet especially his set reviews uh, which are oftentimes backed up by actual play experience, which is really nice, especially very early in the set's release. I know that Usman is liable to proxy up cards he plans on playing just to get reps in as soon as possible. And uh, for this set, Usman wrote an article for Lucky Paper, very much in that style. So first thing I want to do is make sure everyone goes to the site and checks out that article of Usman's. And thank you, Parker, for coordinating all that and editing it. Absolutely. And it was a real pleasure to work with Usman, and I hope we get to do so again. Uh, it's, it's a good companion piece that is a little focused on power level and that's gonna make it a good complement to our community set review oh my god what a transition this guy is so good what a segue and why parker why is our set review not about power level well you see a lot of set review authors like usman himself and others are really good at analyzing the power level and so we decided to look at something different We want to know at Lucky Paper with our community set reviews, what cards have cube owners most excited from a new set prior to its release? What cards are people testing in their cubes before the set's even released? What cards are getting the most hype? And so we ask our respondents to our community set reviews two questions. What cards are you testing? And how highly do you self-rate them? Now, if you want to rate on power level, that's fine. But we don't specify that. We only ask, how do you rate this card by whatever metric, whether that's the mechanics of the card playing well for your cube, or whether it's even how much you like the art and the flavor text. We don't really care. We just want to know which cards are getting the most consensus and the most excitement prior to the set's release. Uh, In order to collect this information, we basically ask cube owners to fill out a survey where they get to tell us which cards they want to play in their cube or cubes from the upcoming set. Then we ask them to score them on a scale of 1 to 10. And again, as Parker mentioned, this is an entirely subjective scale. We really just are asking you, how likely do you think you're going to keep playing this card in your cube? And, you know, if you are designing a peasant cube that is restricted to cards with one word names only, you might be really excited about a card that nobody else even has on their radar. So that card's a 10 for you. It doesn't matter what anyone else thinks about it. I I think we should actually start with uh, the top performers from the related sets first. Let's end on the top nine cards, which is what we're going to run down from Murders at Karlov Manor specifically. But first, there were two other companion products. As always, we got a Commander companion product to Murders at Karlov Manor. We also got special Ravnica Clue Edition cards, which we talked about briefly on our previous set review episodes. And if you want to hear more about the mechanics and themes of these sets or the cards that Anthony and I are excited most about for our own cubes, you can check out those episodes. They'll be in the show notes. But I think we got to talk about specifically Carnage Interpreter from Ravnica Clue Edition. This is one and then hybrid black, red, black, red. So three mana total for a creature devil detective when it enters the battlefield you discard your hand then investigate four times and as long as you have one or fewer cards in hand carnage interpreter gets plus two plus two and has menace and its base power and toughness is three three 
it's a pretty exciting card for people that have a discard matters theme and an artifact theme especially that overlap there is really going to be helped by this card which is why i think we see it performing so high of the people that bothered to spend the time submitting the Ravnica Clue Edition survey, which is a much lower number than we get for the main set. 42% of those people are testing this card and gave it an average rank of 7. 7 is still a pretty high rating. I think this is this set is interesting in that it contained a bunch of cards that were specifically multiplayer focused or specifically trying to be pretty legible because it's it's maybe more of kind of like a box set you would buy if you're newer to the game. So for those reasons, I think it maybe didn't appeal to a lot of cube designers, but they definitely threw in a couple cards to, to you know, a couple chase cards to get people excited. And this does something pretty... I don't know if it's totally novel, but, like, extreme. It's a uh, combination of effects we've seen before. Yeah, like, it sort of calls back to Bedlam Reveler or Young Pyromancer, or, sorry, Season Pyromancer, maybe, of things that are, you know, cycling away your hand. But this, I think, does something that's a little bit more unique in that it gives you cards back in the form of clue tokens, which means if you're also trying to do this hellbent or, like, small hand type effect, it means you can kind of bank those cards away for later and still get the bonus on this individual card by, you know, getting plus two, plus two, but potentially also on other cards that you have in your hand or don't have in your hand yet yeah i mean on its face this is just three mana for a five five with menace that makes four clue tokens and discards your hand which all of these red cards that say discard your hand and usually we see draw a couple cards but as you pointed out anthony this one just says make four clue tokens mm -hmm. so you can draw cards later usually the best way to play these cards is just at the very top of your curve right so you spend the first three turns of the game playing a bunch of one drops and two drops, curving out, dumping your hand, and then you just follow up with this Carnage Interpreter. You really minimize that cost of discarding your hand, and then you get all upside in this, frankly, really incredible body and four clue tokens. I also, I can imagine if you play, you know, a Sacrifice Matters theme, if you have things like Mayhem Devil in your cube, four clue tokens is, I mean, five game pieces it's just three making mana a lot is of insane. Rectangles, yeah. So many rectangles. Yeah, we do see that cards like Carnage Interpreter do tend to be popular. It's a powerful rate, and so, you know, there's some pe people who are just testing it because it's powerful. Uh, it's also highly castable due to the hybrid mana cost. I think 7 out of 10 of the guild pairs could cast this conceivably. And it's also playing in a novel mechanical space. So you've got the artifact theme. I mean, your clues will trigger artifact sacrifice if that's you know, your specific archetype that you care about. There's also the small hand size matters and there's discard matters. That's the other big one. So that combination of effects really makes for a popular card. It is worth noting, like Andy said, though, that fewer people tend to submit responses for these supplemental sets. And so even though this is the most popular card from this set, there are cards from the main set which are more popular certainly an absolute value in terms of the number of testers exactly i was really surprised not to see unruly crisis up here in the spot instead this card seemed like the thing that was just sort of uh you know uh, these cards are are they actually playable and constructed it's difficult to keep track of where things are actually legal these days i assume in legacy i don't know about modern i mean basically every black border card they mm -hmm. print is legal in legacy that's kind of the whole format sure, sure. shtick i doubt they're modern playable but i actually don't know so yeah, maybe there's just not actually as much of a home for this as I thought there would, but cube designers tend to be interested in cards that are really powerful, and this has a 3 mana, 4-4, four, four, with trample, with upside, with upside. Uh, it just seemed like something that would get more people's attention, but apparently not. People like discarding their hands and making a lot of game pieces. Yeah, I'll be honest. I think if you are a strictly power-focused cube designer, you have so many broken blue-green cards that Unruly Crisis is not really in the conversation. Yeah. And I mean, if you're not, the question is, is Unruly Crisis doing something for me that is unique, special, that is really cool and interesting? And I'm not sure it is. It's kind of just like beef, you know? More like shark, octopus, lizard, but yes, point taken. What do you call a shark, octopus, lizard steak? Dinner, baby. That's it. <laughs> We thought the crimes were murder, but the real crimes are Andy's jokes today. <laughs> what can I say? I do my best. So we also had a survey out for the accompanying Commander set for Murders at Karloff Manor. Just like other supplemental products like Raftica Clue Edition, there are a lot of players that just ignore these completely for their cubes. I know a lot of people just don't pay attention to Commander cards at all, either because they really are making decisions on the cube design strictly based on how cards are performing in other constructed formats, or at least heavily influenced by that, or they just don't like commander designed cards. But there is one card again here that kind of stands out above the rest. 
So the top card here that stands out is Unshakable Tail. This is two and a black for a zombie detective. It's a 3-2. Whenever Unshakable Tail enters the battlefield and at the beginning of your upkeep, surveil one. Whenever one or more creature cards are put into your graveyard from your library, investigate. And two mana, sacrifice a clue. Return Unshakable Tail from your graveyard to your hand. Text. Lots of text. There's a lot of text here. I'm trying library to figure out zone, this card Graveyard does. zone. In play zone. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not surprised to see this card performing well here. This seems like a card that you really would be excited to play if you have a high tolerance for individual card complexity, let's say, and you also have a lot of graveyard matters, self-mill, or zombie themes going on. I know the zombie subtype is often sought after for cube designers, even if only because of Gravecrawler, which is a card that's very popular in a lot of cubes. And this one just does a lot. It's recur it recurs itself, it fills the graveyard, it also potentially draws cards if you are flipping over your creatures into your graveyard with that surveillability. So does all kinds of things while also having a lot of synergy with other self-mill, which we don't often see this kind of very explicit synergy for self-mill. Usually the other support for self-mill themes is just things that are good in the graveyard, you know, flashback, whatever. This cares about actually putting creature cards from your library into your graveyard, which is the act of milling. So kind of a unique payoff in that sense and filling a space that maybe is not filled by other cards in existence. Yeah, it's kind of funny flavor in that it, it generates clue tokens and then it gives your clues this additional ability that you can sacrifice them and then instead of still for two mana but instead of drawing a card from your library you draw this back from your graveyard to me it still doesn't seem like the most exciting package but i guess it just does a lot of things so it's gonna do something huh does that flavor represent like well i guess it's an unshakable tail and so when you find another clue he's back on the case or something it's yeah. something like that for sure i like he's that. a zombie and he can keep coming back if you discover more clues he's gonna be right behind you I guess. Obviously, that tends to be less important to our respondents than the mechanics. Typically, yeah. So this is being yeah. tested by 40% of the people that submitted any card specifically for the Commander set, and has a rating of 6.7, which is high, but not over the moon. So there you got it. And for supplemental products, you know, around 40% is actually not super high, because again, a lot of the people will only bother filling out this survey if they're testing a card from this set, specifically, like they're going out of their way to do it. So... Definitely much less absolute popularity than cards in the main Murders at Karlov Manor set, which we will get to now. Parker, where should we start? Well, we should start with a little bit of description. Murders yeah. of Karlov Manor had 220 almost respondents from the cube community. And the median respondent submitted nine cards from this set that they are testing. That's... A good handful, but it is less than many of uh, 2023's standard legal releases. For example, March of the Machine was one of the most contentious sets from last year for Cube, and Murders of Karlov Manor has even less consensus. So we're not going to see any standouts or quote-unquote Cube staples in this set relative to sets like Wilds of Eldraine or Midnight Hunt from several years ago. That said, Murders of Karlov Manor, I keep saying of, but Murders at Karlov Manor is still a really synergistic environment. It's actually got a different composition of rarities than previous standard legal sets due to the different pack nature. So I think there's still a lot to um, investigate <laughs> about this set for Cube. Yeah, you're calling out my jokes, but there's a little bit of hypocrisy there. You should go read your own set review article, which I got to say, I have loved how more creative and expressive you've gotten with these set reviews. But the Murders at Karlov Manor written review, which you should all read because we're only going to cover the top nine cards here. And this has many, many, many more results than, uh, than we can possibly cover in a podcast. But it also contains a bunch of uh, Parker jokes. Parker jokes? Don't you mean erudite literary devices? Parker that. and I are in a long-standing fight in our virtual playgroup over who's more of the dad. Write in. Comment Today, below me. who you think is more of the dad, me or Parker. Let's just dive into the ninth most tested card, the ninth most popular card from Murders at Karlov Manor. That card is Cryptic Coat. For two and a blue, you get an artifact equipment. When Cryptic Coat enters the battlefield, Cloak the top card of your library, then attach Cryptic Coat to it. 
Equipped creature gets plus one plus O and can't be blocked, and you can pay one and a blue, return cryptic coat to its owner's hand. Notably, this does not have an equip cost, so the only way you can equip a creature is by returning it to your hand and then recasting it. So it'll always cloak the top card of your library and equip that creature. This is tested by 17, almost 18% of our respondents with an average ranking of 6.1. This is, by the way, the most tested card that involves face-down creatures as cloaks or disguise from this set. So as the most tested card from it, it's still got less than a fifth of the total respondents who are testing it. That doesn't really bode well for one of the flagship mechanics of Murders at Karloff Manor, but I think there's still things to love about this card. Yeah, broadly speaking, Cloak and Disguise were not popular amongst cube designers for, I think, a lot of the reasons we covered in our mechanics episode, perhaps. It's challenging if you have any other Morpher manifest in your cube to have them side by side, because now you have these two different kinds of face-down things you have to remember the difference between. And I think more likely, a lot of people just don't like having one card that has Morph, or in this case, Disguise, because if you know what it is, then it's kind of... A lot of the mystery and fun of the mechanic is lost. Now, Cryptic Coat actually being the equivalent of Manifest, you know, it's putting a random card face down, not a known card that you could possibly, you know, have memorized from the cube list. I think kind of skirts that a little bit, but nonetheless, I think these mechanics were largely a miss for cube designers, at least compared to other Hallmark mechanics we see in major sets. I'm a little bit surprised by that, to be honest, because Morph and Manifest, even though contemporary rate is is definitely a little bit higher, so they're not necessarily the most powerful effects compared to modern cards, they're still very beloved mechanics. And, you know, when people talk about, oh, uh, Kanza Tarkir is coming back on Arena and you can draft it, everybody's really excited about playing Morph. So I expected there to at least be just that love for these mechanics, but maybe it does get a big knock that they are a little bit different, so it makes things confusing. I will say that specifically Cryptic Coat it seems like much more, it doesn't have necessarily all the same logistical issues because you're putting a card face down, but you're also putting this Cryptic Coat on top of it. So it's much less ambiguous what that face down card is. I mean, it kind of reminds me of obviously like Rage Form and Cloud Form, the enchantments that did a similar thing with Manifest, but is, like we said, sort of powered up into contemporary power level and gives you that ability to sort of replay it, which is kind of cool. I mean, it's kind of just like a three mana, three, two, unblockable that when it dies, draws you a card or better than that, because you can just pick it up and recast this for five mana uh, and still get your well, other It draws two, you two. itself as if it was its own clue. You pay two to draw itself and then well, you then can replay it. Well, then draw something new that's going to also be a cryptic thing. Well, but you're not really drawing that card unless it's also a creature that you can possibly turn face up. Well, you... Sure, let's not worry about the details too much. Let's get and then very lost the upside in the of if it is like, oh, that's just like a 6-6 six, six there. Well, you can flip up your 6-6. Six, six. It still has the, the cloak equipped to it, and you can end a game pretty quickly. I got a couple of questions about why there was no mention of this for the Bun Magic Cube in the episode where we talked about the cards we're interested in for our own cubes. And I got to say, I got very close. I think this card is very powerful. And the thing that got me really close on it is the idea of running this in combination with Stoneforge Mystic in like a more controlling deck that wants to hold up mana. And then you can, at instant speed entirely, just pay four mana every turn cycle to make another 2-2. Two -two. That's really cool to me, and I really like that use case. And I like it as a like more off-the-beaten-path target for Stoneforge Mystic and what you can make Stoneforge Mystic able to do. And I still might come back to it. I'm not you know saying I'm ruling it out forever, but... The unblockable thing is really kind of a bummer to me. We talked about this at length on our original set review episode, and obviously this episode is going to come out after our episode talking about different supposed orders of interaction, which there was definitely a lot of scuttlebutt about that episode and the various ways in which I was wrong. But needless Should to say... Should we go over all of those right now real quick? I don't think it's good listening for anybody. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> needless to say, I don't love unblockable because it is fundamentally less interactive than creatures that can be blocked. And I can definitely imagine board states where... I otherwise have a very good control in the game, except because I don't have a small removal spell for this creature, I just lose. Or, you know, probably more likely, I just am forced to repeatedly remove a tiny little creature because I have no other way to deal with it. I can't block it with my board just because this card happens to have unblockable. And that's just not the kind of play patterns I'm that excited about. If this didn't have unblockable and instead had any other little trinket benefit, I'd probably be all over it, to be perfectly honest. 
Yeah, I mean, I do like the sort of similar to the, the, the things like Rage Form, the the fact that it is this kind of like mix and match. I get to combine this card with this equipment, and there's some amount of mystery to it, but it still has some baseline effectiveness. There's a lot that I think works really well about this card, but I agree that the play pattern of can't be blocked and you kind of can't really kill it that easily is not great. I love the ward. Give me the ward, but the yeah, the fact that it's like unless you actually remove the equipment, they can just keep making things unblockable, which is not really right, what I'm right, all right. about. And if they can remove the equipment, then they're going to do it mid combat and eat your creature, which can now be blocked. So that is cool. I don't know. Kind of a swing there in terms of the low and high outcomes. Next up, we've got Aftermath Analyst. This is two mana, one and a green for a creature elf detective. It is a one three. When it enters the battlefield, mill three cards. It has the ability for three and a green sacrifice Aftermath Analyst. Return all land cards from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. Two mana, one three, reasonable floor, mill some cards, kind of does the Seder Wayfinder thing, but then also gives you this much more powerful kind of, uh, what's that, what's that four mana sorcery? Splendid. Splendid reclamation reclamation effect of being able to buy back all your lands for a huge ramp thing. Seems reasonable. I feel like there's always, always desire for more of these kind of landfall enabler type cards. This is very splashy, and I really like the idea of playing it with cards that actually care about landfall so you're not just ramping but you're also getting you know like three triggers on your whatever especially maybe you milled a bunch of fetch lands and then you get like 12 triggers why is this not in the regular cube anthony i don't i don't know the illustration doesn't get, <laughs> excite me it's not my favorite illustration either but think uh, about how cool it would be love, with a myriad I'm not angel really looking to add a bunch more one threes in that environment yeah very defensive stat line yeah. there for sure not any games quickly in any sense one three is definitely why i'm off it i just Blocks two twos and two ones and just like really sad to have that come down on turn two. If your aggro opponent is looking at that, they're thinking, well, it's now removal spell or two for one myself to kill this thing. It's just really bad. And we should say this is being tested by 18% of people that responded with a rating of 6.8, which is just a little bit higher than the cryptic coat, which I'm actually surprised to see the cryptic coat a little bit lower than than this. I think cryptic code is an unknown quantity. I yeah. Mean, that's again, fair. really, like we're not looking at this score as power level or anything. It's like no, confidence. Of not. Yeah. It's like confidence that they're going to stick around. And even when we see very cool cards, uh, if they are novel, they often will score relatively low in the actual points because how confident is the average person across the full respondents going to be? They're actually going to keep playing this card. We never played with a card like it before. It's hard to say. So, you know, aftermath analyst, if you already have a Splendid Reclamation, or you've been wanting a Splendid Reclamation, but you don't want it to just be on a spell, you want some other sort of better floor of just having, you know, a two-drop two creature, which is what will attack and block. You'll, you'll know if you want this if you have a deep self-mill or, or lands matter or landfall theme. The seventh most popular card from Murders of Karloff Manor is Deduce. This is one and a blue for an instant, draw a card, and investigate. It's being tested by 19.2% of our respondents with a very low rating of 5.9. There's actually another card even higher up this list that also has that low of a rating, which is surprising. Usually cards that are this high in the top, you know, nine cards of a set are not raking that lowly, but I guess there's people that are kind of begrudgingly trying this out. They think they want to give it a shot, but they're not confident about it. This is basically your artifact matters think twice with a slightly better rate in that you only have to pay two generic to get that second card as opposed to two in a blue, which I do think is good rate in a lot of environments. The fact that they're both at instant speed really matters. So I can see this card being appealing. I'm a little surprised people are so ambivalent on it, I guess. Like you would think this would be one of the cards that is so similar to a pass card. It's like relatively simple mechanically. You would think you would know if you wanted this card or not and not have so many people presumably that are kind of waffling on it yeah i mean i feel like it's we have so many different blue draw cards with some trinket text or some other little effect or some structural differences to make it work differently in different environments that there's just a lot to choose from i don't think a lot of people are sitting there thinking oh finally they've printed the one for me but i do think that a lot of people when they are designing cubes that have artifact themes or investigate themes they're definitely going to come across this and be like yep that's the, the the blue trinket draw spell for me I think it suffers from a branding issue. I like this so much more than the stupid hard evidence that makes a crab and an mm-hmm. investigate token. Give me this over hard evidence every day. But over, it's got, over a Tetris investigator? But it's got very, very like basic, generic art, the title Deduce. I mean, actually, I think... Deduce is a great, great I, name. I like the name of the card, it's true, but I think it, it's not inspiring in the same way that 
you know, something like Hard Evidence is, even though I think this card is more exciting to play with, at least for me, than Hard Evidence is. It's also, despite being the seventh most popular card from this set, only tested by a fifth of our respondents, which is, if you look at the seventh most popular card from a different set, one that maybe got a little more one that people hype liked. before it was released, or yeah, whatever, one that just got more cube excitement, then you'll see that the seventh most popular card is tested by a larger share of the respondents and has captured, you know, a, a greater portion of those people. I don't know. I like it though. It's it's just a really functional nuts and bolts design. Yeah, if I had a like artifact matters cube of any kind, I'd be very excited to jam this in there. All right, our sixth most popular card from Murders at Karloff Manor is Escape Tunnel. This is a land. It has two tap abilities. The first is tap sacrifice. Search your library for a basic land card, put it onto the battlefield tapped, then shuffle, just like Evolving Wilds. And the second tap ability is tap sacrifice. Target creature with power two or less can't be blocked this turn. So a strictly better Evolving Wilds that has a little bit of like functionality, I would presume in an aggro deck, but you can see yourself using this in a lot of scenarios. Maybe you trigger your ninja or you achieve a like saboteur trigger for damaging your opponent. It's tested by a fifth of our respondents with an average rank of 8.4. The highest rank of any of these cards in the top, I'm scrolling down the list trying to find maybe some weird outlier at the bottom, but it seems you like the highest to. ranked card. You can just card. click on rank to sort them by the rank. Yeah, okay, I guess. Yeah, that, <laughs> that works. I made these sortable tables just for you. You know, honestly, <laughs> here, here's the real answer. I was like, part of me was afraid if I clicked that, I wouldn't be able to get back, which is not a logical way to feel. But I've been looking at this You'll list. You'll never be able to get back. But I'm looking at this list. We're going up it. I don't want like the order to change or anything. So I was like, if I click that, what if I can't get back? But it, <laughs> it is the highest rated card amongst all of the cards in our responses. Yeah, and oftentimes we'll end up seeing that, and it'll be like, oh, there's one thing, you know, with five testers that has a very high rating, and we we cut off at some some limit, which varies set to set depending on how many responses we get. But this is both the highest rated and tested by a ton of people. I suspect Relatively this is a ton of people. Still well, a fifth. Tw- a fifth. That's. Uh, I mean, compared to the 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 highest we're gonna get, this is pretty good. That's what I'm saying. Um, relative. That's what relative means. It's <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, consider was tested by 85 percent of respondents or something. This yeah. Is, uh, you know, I just, remember. Remember. Consider. Never yeah. forget. I, I think escape tunnels just gonna end up being again like a staple for peasant cubes at least uh, because a lot of people end up playing evolving wilds in these environments and that little bit of extra upside is kind of cool so i'm into it i think that's absolutely why we're seeing this high of a rank if you're on evolving wilds currently then escape tunnel is just better and evolving wilds honestly had some room to grow it's not you know it's not like the perfect design or anything where any extra abilities suddenly ruin the experience so I don't know. To me, that explains a lot with this high rank. Evolving Wilds has some room to grow. Hmm. I don't know. I mean, Evolving Wilds is a pretty great, flavorful name. Escape Tunnel, I definitely get the the connection with making one of your small creatures unblockable. The second ability is very intuitive there, yeah. I don't know if the first one is, so I'm, I'm I'm, I'm not sure I'm with you on that one, Parker. I was more pointing out that it sounds like a fun pun because it's evolving wild, it's room to grow, but oh, you could, you know, okay, you could take that differently if you wanted to. All right, That's Parker, fine. you got any more bits? No We're more doing bits. bits now on the show, Parker. <laughs> Did you bring a bit for everybody? Did you bring a bit to share with the class? No. In that case, <laughs> not. let's move on to the next card, which is Snarling Gorehound. This is a dog. It costs one black mana. It's a 1-1. One, one. It has menace, and whenever another creature with power two or less enters the battlefield under your control, surveil one. This is being tested by 20% of our respondents, so that's kind of where we're at here <laughs> with all these cards. Pretty similar space uh, with an average rating of 6.9. What the dog doing? What the dog doing? This reminds me of... Dragon's Rage Channeler, but a like popper Dog's Rage Channeler. It's it's like a popper version Dragon's <laughs> Rage Channeler, right? It doesn't ever get bigger, but it's a small creature with a like evasive ability that generates some value over time as your deck does its thing. And a nice clean card, it must be said. I think the art is very cool. Like I'm into this card if your cube is the right place you can play it. It's kind of grisly. And the flavor text is suggesting that it's chewing on human appendages, and that's the gore in question. Yeah, I, just, right I, I find I myself I find myself asking, is this a good dog? <laughs> that's what you're smiling about over there? <laughs> yeah, that's all I got. <laughs> <laughs> 
I think this card's cool. It definitely doesn't have the highest power level ceiling, but I, again, this is a common, so I think maybe a lot of pauper and peasant cubers are interested in this one, where I know sometimes the exciting build around one drops are hard to come by at those rarities, so yeah, I think it's a very elegant card, and if your cube is the right context for it in terms of power level, then uh, yeah, worth a look for sure. And the Gorian is, to me, I think that's a upside. Yeah, I mean, it is a flavor home run in my own Pulp Nouveau cube, which is focused a lot on this kind of noir, pulpy flavor. Your cubes were eaten good this set. Oh, yes. The fourth most popular card from Murders at Karloff Manor is not one card, but in fact, we're going to put 10 cards here, and that is the full cycle of Surveil Lands. The most popular one was Underground Mortuary. This is a land, it's a swamp and a forest, so it taps to add a black or a green. It also enters the battlefield tapped, and when it enters the battlefield, you surveil one, and we got the full cycle of 10 of these. Mortuary is the most popular one on the survey, just edging out Undercity Sewers, the Demir one, and Thundering Falls, but as you go down the list, they're all up here kind of high. Like, all these cards were pretty popular, and also quite highly rated, so people knew if they were into these lands, and quite a few people were. I feel like we talked a lot about these lands on our episode talking about the cycles of this set, Anthony. So I want to throw this to Parker. Parker, how do you feel about these surveil lands? How do they compare to other options designers have access to? Well, I like them for a few reasons. One is that it just does something different than shock lands. And so if you are designing a cube and shock lands feel too powerful, but you still want to have a fetch dual interaction, then these lands might be a good option. I also like, I mean, just from a practical consideration that these will probably be cheaper than the Shocklands for the foreseeable future. And so, you know, it's it's a way to increase access among cube curators who don't proxy and maybe have a strict budget. I've also seen, even with the very limited amount of constructed play since the release of Murders at Karloff Manor, that these lands are quite strong even with shock lands because if there's even one in your library all of a sudden if you're fetching on turn one or you know you don't you don't have anything to cast with the land that you're fetching then you can surveil instead of getting a tapped shock land you know that's that's quite a big bonus when it comes essentially at no opportunity cost the opportunity cost is occasionally you'll draw it when you would like to be fetching it and then you have an ETB tapped land, but you know people are already playing Triumphs in Constructed, and so what's one more, I guess? Well, to push back on that a little bit, I do think every subsequent one is a lot worse. I have historically been a bit of a hardliner on not liking tapped lands in my decks as a player, and therefore including very few in my cubes, and I've softened on that. But I will say that I think the first tap land, especially a fetchable one, is very justifiable, and every subsequent one has to clear like a exponentially higher bar because that makes it that much harder to curve out when you need to. Sure. I think it's just a really nice tactical tool that's now available to cube designers and then also players who are working with a sh- fetch shock mana base. This raises a very important question, Parker, which is, does this mean we will never see my beloved bicycle land cycle finished? I think we will. I have faith. Not only because more and more cards are being printed every year, but also bicycle lands do have a different effect that is complementary, not necessarily strictly worse. There are situations where I would rather have, you know, a scattered groves relative to the surveil situation. I love my beautiful bicycle lands. I would always take my bicycle lands. They're so beautiful. I believe in you. They finished the um, stupid, like, signet land cycle in the commander set. And that, or maybe it's an upcoming commander set. I don't even know. But they're finishing that cycle. And if they can finish that stupid thing, <laughs> then surely they can finish a cycle whose Look, lands actually tap for mana by themselves. I don't think it's a matter of them being incapable of or not being aware of what cycles are unfinished. No, you're right. They could finish that stupid one. They could finish the stupid one. That is a dumb one <laughs> yeah. to finish, to be honest. I mean, I'm sure they got the Everybody's reasons. been asking for that. Our third most popular card from Murders at Karloff Manor is Sharp-Eyed Rookie. This is a one in a green creature, human detective. It has vigilance. Then it has a mouthful of an ability. Whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, if its power is greater than Sharp-Eyed Rookie's power or its toughness is greater than Sharp-Eyed Rookie's toughness, 
put out counter on Sharp-Eyed Rookie and investigate. It's a 2-2. And in case you zoned out there, that trigger is just an evolve trigger that also investigates whenever whenever it succeeds. Is evolve technically I... that complicatedly written? Yes. Yeah. But also, I'm confused. Didn't they start just saying we're going to put keywords on things when the keywords make sense? I guess maybe evolve isn't very flavorful for a sharp-eyed rookie. Not that that's the most important thing to talk about here, but... You could make it a Simic Merfolk detective or whatever, and then it works. I No other whatever. podcast is talking about this, Anthony, so someone's <laughs> got to do it. That's absolutely right. What's going on inside yeah. the building when it comes to the keyword evolve? I think uh, evolve read simpler on gate crash cards because it was explained in reminder text, which can often shortcut things. That sounds accurate, yeah. This is tested, by the way, by almost a quarter of our respondents with an average rank of 5.9, a kind of low confidence rating here, similar to deduce, but despite that, very popular. It has to be one of the lowest ratings we've seen for a top three card from a set, maybe ever. I have to like go back and check all our surveys to see if that's true, but it feels so low for a top three card, so... I don't know what it is that's making people not confident about this. I know for me, I definitely did a double take at this card for my own Bun Magic Cube and then was like, I just can't with this art and flavor. Like, I don't know. Some some of the times I can ignore when the flavor feels wrong. Like, I like to just forget that Ledger Shredder is a bird wearing a waistcoat. I'm just like, you can barely see the waistcoat. Just, for, just forget about that. Pretend it's just a cool <laughs> bird. But here it's so in your face that this is like very strongly flavored with this very particular vibe which some people may or may not find is anachronistic with their conception of the vibe of magic in general i find it's a little kitsch and i actually write about this in the article a little bit but like if you're making a set about murders as humans that's like pretty rough and if and if you treated the set with like a grim dark you know serious in a strad vibe in a strad vibe to fantasy like a lot of magic has done historically then It's just depressing and nobody wants to read the card file because it's like really sad. So instead, they make it cute and sometimes ironic as with the flavor text of Snarling Gorehound. It's meant to be humorous and that makes it, oh, haha, funny murder instead of like really serious murder. And when you look at the whole card file, that means it's a little bit kitschy and the flavor feels a little bit dissonant from magic simply because they had to sanitize all of this homicide that's happening. Sanitizing homicide, that's not something we hear about a lot these days, is it? Yeah, sure. <laughs> no. Definitely no, you know. Anyway, it seems laundering like this would be, uh, of genocide going on in our country, none of that at all. I will oh. say, just from a gameplay perspective, this seems like a fun card to play with. It's your two mana 2 2. As soon as you cast your next creature, it's immediately going to grow if it's, you know, bigger on turn three. And then, yeah, you're attacking with a 3 3 on turn three. And also, you have that clue that you can crack later when you're running out of cards. So, for aggressive green decks, this actually seems like a great fit. I Not agree. Not necessarily aggressive. Vigilance is great for any. It's true. Green and decks. it's got vigilance. So, yeah, it's going to even keep up with a more aggressive deck. I'll also say that I think maybe the reason that it doesn't have Evolve is they've just linked those two abilities of you get the counter and you get the clue. I'm, I'm thinking a little bit of Scurry Oak, which gives you a counter when it evolves, and a squirrel, but they just separated those two effects that whenever it gets a counter, you get a squirrel, which I think I really like that sort of splitting up in that case, but here... You could also write whenever it evolves, uh, get yeah, a clue. Yeah, I could have done that too. Scurry Oak goes infinite with a ham sandwich also, that is which true. is maybe why they linked the abilities. Which is very flavorful. You show up at the scurry oak with a ham sandwich, and those squirrels are going to come. Is there any way to go infinite with it in the regular cube through any convoluted no, combination of cards? No, there's one white card that I... It's Audric's Outrider, I think, that it, it does a lot with, uh, but it's not like an infinite combo. It's just a value pile. <laughs> make very many of something. Okay, maybe but... if... I think if you threw in three other cards, you could probably right. make I'm trying to figure out if you can get there with a combination of... A Seer, of... uh... Oh, um, well, okay, you need a you need a- Soul Diviner to remove the counters, so now we need a way to untap the Soul Diviner. Um, I don't know, it's hard. Regular Cube does not give you as many disgusting combo tools as one might want. It's true. All right, well, we've talked about one sort of kitschy investigator. Maybe we should move on to the next. I have the pleasure of reading Novice Inspector. This is one white for a creature, human detective. It is a one-two. When it enters the battlefield, investigate. What a novel design. 
ABT, baby. This is being tested by 23% of uh, the respondents, almost 24, with an average rating of 7.6, which is notably high for what this card is. I, I was going to say I also low have to say, for what this card is. I, I think both these numbers are lower than I expected. Well, I also want to point out that this card isn't even visible on the survey. Oh, wait, no, it is because it's a new name. Never mind. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> it's a new card. All right. And the number one card whoa, is... Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold on, hold on. Slow down, slow down, slow down. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I expected these numbers to be higher. Honestly, it makes me wary of, I don't want to like be too presumptuous, but I hope that we are not impacting the survey results too heavily with our podcast we put out before this episode, because I was kind of like, I don't need a second Thraben Inspector, and I wonder if other people took Andy, that to heart. known Thraben Inspector hater. I don't hate it. It's fine. I, I'm known Thraben Inspector. It's finer. It's totally fine. But yeah, only 23.7%. You know, again, compare this to, I mean, you know, consider as an upgrade over Opt, which I guess makes a big difference, but Opt was a fairly popular cube card. Therapy and Inspector is a fairly popular cube card. To see only 23.7% of people are trying this is, it's definitely lower than I expected it to be. And I really wonder about the 7.6. I mean, I guess there's some people that are, there's probably a lot of 10s for people that know they want this effect. Maybe some people that just are skeptical of whether they're going to want to keep two of this effect in their cube. Are there people out there that have wanted a Thraben Inspector, but not Innistrad themed? There's probably someone out there that it wants has, that. They, they have a, a detectives-only policy. I'm very interested in that for Pulp Nouveau for precisely this reason. But do you not have Thraben Inspector in Pulp Nouveau because it's not pulpy enough? I have two. I have two Thraben Inspectors, but I will be switching at least one of them to Novice Inspector. Wow. So they have solved the problem for <laughs> exactly you. Yeah. Great. I'm, I'm happy for you. Did you give it a 10, Parker? Uh, I think so, but don't quote me on it. Well, we can quote you on it, because for those of you who don't remember, we have a great lookup tool where you can look up the past results of all these surveys, uh, which most useful to do for yourself. You can type in your own cube the ID. The intention is to do it for yourself. Yeah, but, but you can also type in Parker's cube ID and just see uh, what he actually rated this bad boy. That's Pulp Nouveau, everybody. <laughs> N-O-U-V-E-A-W. That brings us all the way to the number one card from Murders at Karlov Manor. This is a decent bit more popular than the other cards, too, at least noticeably so. I mean, we've been, we've been between 23% and 17% for all of the top nine, and now we're making a big jump all the way up to exactly one-third of our respondents are testing the card Demand Answers. This is one in a red for an instant. As an additional cost to cast this spell, sacrifice an artifact, or discard a card, draw two cards. As I mentioned, being tested by a third of our respondents with an average rank of seven this is a strict upgrade on Thrill of Possibility, which was a strict upgrade on, uh, what was the call before that? Tormenting Voice. I remember when Thrill of Possibility was printed, everyone was like, wow, better Tormenting Voice. And now we get even better Tormenting Voice. They're just slowly inching this effect up and up and up to make it a little better and a little better and a little better. And yeah, I mean, this is the kind of bread and butter effect that works in a lot of cubes. It's card draw. It's a discard outlet. It cares about artifacts in this case because you can sacrifice your like left behind clue tokens or you know blood tokens or treasure tokens or whatever. You turn them into actual cards. So it does a lot for a lot of cubes. It's a common, so it can be played in pauper and peasant cubes as well. I didn't expect a card like this to perform a full 10% better than Thraben Inspector again, but I think this card was always going to perform about 33%. I guess what I'm surprised about is not having any card in this set be more popular than that. Yeah, I agree with that um, assessment and that confusion as well. I'm shocked that Tristani Three Whispers isn't higher. That's the card I'm most excited for for my powerful cube. But at on, at the same time, like there are so many kind of odd designs in this set or build around designs that it makes sense to me that people are interested in specific synergies more than they are interested in just the raw rate. Yeah, I mean, if we're talking about cards that we're surprised about, I'm surprised to see Long Goodbye all the way down at only 12% of people, which I expected this to be the slam dunk of, you know, known quantity, yeah. but slightly more powerful that people will just get excited about. Yeah, I'm also surprised to find Long Goodbye that low on the list. Maybe there are more people out there that are in the same not liking uncountable camp as I am, or maybe people just feel like they have enough of that effect and don't need the additional complexity. I don't know. I mean, is it just play boosters? Like... When I was looking at the set spoiler, I was like, there are so many two-mana do-nothing enchantments. There's, like, one about the detective's big brain, and there's one about <laughs> turning your lands. We all remember the detective's big brain. 
Eliminate for comparison, which was printed in Corset 21, was tested by 42% of our respondents and had still a pretty high rating of 6.9. And a lot of things have changed. You know, maybe we've also just gotten a lot more respondents. So that means that proportionally a lot of cards have been pushed down the list. I'm not to sure people we have. How many more. respondents were there at survey? I feel like we've been kind of plateaued in our respondents for all. That's true. I mean, this is only 115-ish responses. Okay, so. that's, that's substantially fewer. That's true. So, I mean, the different response pool is big and, you know... Obviously, in intervening years, we've got more removal spells, so maybe the bar is just higher for any removal spell to get in. But, yeah, a little surprised to see that so low, too. I mean, I'm not mad, to be clear. No, I'm happy. Like, I'm don't glad. Think, I don't love the can't be countered. I don't know. So I think that's an upside for more environments, but it's definitely strictly more powerful, which is just surprising to me. I also just like seeing more not the most powerful cards in the set at the top of the list, right? Yeah. Like, Demand Answers, Novice Inspector, Sharp-Eyed Rookie, The Surveil Lands snarling gorehound like these are the top cards from the set and they are nowhere near the most powerful cards from this set not even yeah close. that's a really good point i mean we've been talking about how a lot of these cards fall within a pretty close band of popularity another way we could just read that is that we're seeing less of an extreme sort of hockey stick of the, the clearly like power outliers are standing out and everything else is kind of falling behind now maybe we're just seeing a much flatter uh, sort of perspective because a lot want. of people are interested in more different cards for different applications, uh, which just sort of flattens out that whole curve. So it's all yeah, happening. I mean, I could definitely see that being a, a narrative that makes sense. What would you guess is the most powerful card in the set if we're only looking at like constructed or modern viability? I think Coat has a decent argument for being there. The Surveil lands are kind of hard to compare to non-lands in terms of like sure. raw power level, but I think they're also quite powerful. I think, I think these other questions are going to come down to like specific metas. Like I think I've seen yeah. Aspiring Spike playing Archdruid's Charm in Modern, specifically in like the, uh, whatchamacallit, the primetime decks with the uh, Amulet of Vigor Amulet decks. So like that just is kind of a role player in that deck, but I don't think you look at Archdruid's Charm and say like that's a modern card. It just happens to fit with a particular... There's Vein Ripper, which just... Won a Pro Tour, I believe. Yeah, it's like wow, a Wow, congratulations, six drop. Vane Ripper, on that the Pro Tour win. So much yeah. for the kitschy horror, by the way. Vane Ripper. <laughs> not, <laughs> yeah. Not the most kitschy. <laughs> yeah, so I guess I'm saying, with that little thought exercise, the most powerful cards in this set are still strong. They just happen to have these, like, really big synergistic hurdles, or at least synergistic hooks on the card. Like, do we want to be playing the face down creature so that comes with a little bit of like logistics hurdle for a cube and then there's also like are we using stoneforge mystic do we care that it's an artifact do we want to flip things face up or like cheat big permanents into play by flickering our own face down thing or whatever and a lot of the power in that set is like that rather than just having like a planeswalker who's just like raw stats and power level busting into cubes that way so i guess i'm saying because there's synergy on a lot of these power outliers, maybe that's limiting the amount of cube curators who are interested in them. I suppose I don't have a good, like, I feel like I don't have the ability to intuitively say that these cards are more synergistic pound for pound than the average standard set. I feel like it's a hard thing to get my whole head around, but yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's just a set that doesn't have any like real huge power outliers for constructed period. Maybe if it did, we'd see a card up there with 50-60% of respondents playing it, but maybe... meanwhile, this is a set with a 4 mana 8/4 with upside with upside. I mean, there's definitely been some power creep here and there's some cards that just I mean, to I... me read kind of ridiculously, but maybe they're I... just like We're in just... constructed metas. A uh, 4 mana 8/4 is just not that relevant, It's just I not. Guess. I mean, like I I think yeah, that's a that's a thing that like you just got to update in your head, right? Like I remember when Doom Whisperer I'm came out. I'm not gonna. I'm gonna keep being excited <laughs> about four mana four fours. <laughs> I remember when Doom Whisper. Doom Whisper was the last card I misevaluated this way because they misevaluated it so bad. That's the five mana six six flyer with substantial upside. You could pay life to surveil two, surveil. I believe, with Doom yep. Whisperer. A lot of upside on that card too, and I was like, this card's just like nuts. And it's just not. A four mana card that dies to removal is a four mana card that dies to removal. It's twenty twenty four. The mole's not that good. The Doom Whisper wasn't either. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep living in, in my world, whatever that's like. It's also not surprising but notable that the cases really fell pretty low. The first one is uh what is it called? The case of the skeleton. Yeah, that one's a powerful <laughs> card, for example, but yeah, maybe just a novel mechanic people are not interested in yeah. messing with. Case of the stash skeleton only tested by 
less than 10% of people. It's it's number 40 or somewhere about thereabouts in terms of uh, the actual ranking. So yeah, the cases, I guess, were just a little bit too too much in terms of their, their design and, and understandability is, is kind of my understanding there. It's not just cases. It's also collect yeah, evidence. Nobody likes collect suspects, evidence. Suspects Ooh, yeah. and split cards are all, we didn't discuss any of those today. It's not to say that they're bad for cube, right? It's just maybe a little less exciting or if you're testing it, you're testing it with less confidence than some of these other cards. Can we just so, say this set was a dud? Can no, we say I think it? we can say this, this set was a great success because it had a new land cycle, which cube designers love, and a reprinting of Thraben Inspector. That's all that cube designers need to be happy. <laughs> I do think the lands are great for cube. In terms of like the long-term impact on cube design, Like I think the lands are fantastic for cube design now and in the future. Otherwise, I'm, after this conversation, inclined to say, like, Swing and a miss. Look, there's tons of, of, of illustrations with hats for all those people with unstable cubes or whichever the unset was that cares about hats. Oh, no. We, we can't stoop that low. <laughs> um, I'm willing to say that it's a dud for power-motivated cubes. I I don't know. It's it's weird for me because but I have one cube. this is cube that we're looking at in the responses here. I mean, this is like your cube is like the cube that got the most out of this set of any cube imaginable, right? Is it? Is it Right. So I, I can't say it's a dud because... Like, I have a set that, or a, a cube that practically rotated because of murders at Karloff Manor, but I have this other powerful cube that's only interested in, like, two cards and categorically dismissed all of the premier mechanics of this set. So I guess I'm saying, yeah, this is just a design tool or, like, a world that you can build a cube around as I kind of unintentionally built Pulp Nouveau around this world before it existed. But that world is somewhat insular compared to some of Magic's other sets. Yeah, I mean, there's going to be a cube for every set, right? No matter what set comes out, somebody's going to be thrilled that they finally got their box ticked or whatever. But I think we can pretty safely say this cube was a miss for a lot of people with cubes of all different kinds, not just power-motivated cubes, but kind of across the board. The lands, I think, are likely to be the, the lasting legacy of this set for most cube designers, that and you know anybody like you, Parker, that has you know pursued these specific themes or this particular flavor to a profound degree. Yeah. And on that bombshell, that concludes this episode of Lucky Paper Radio. Our final set review. Make sure to go check out the written set review on our website as well as Usman Jamil's article doing a full card-by-card -card breakdown of the cards that he's most excited about from his set. He basically walks through his survey responses and explains them in great detail, which, you know, I think that the reason set reviews are so popular, those that style of set review is so beloved by so many people, is that it's a, like, exercise in card evaluation, and you get to see his thought process into why he's evaluating cards the way he is, rather than just looking at the end results, the uh, total score. So make sure you treat yourself to all that reasoning. The why is what really matters in an article like that. Yes. Parker, thanks for joining us. It's always a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks. We can have you on sometimes to discuss something not related to a set review. People are dying for more Parker in their life. We got to have you on. Next time you have a, a little idea that's nipping at your brain that you just really got to talk about, let us know. Should Let's we talk about with you. orders of interaction? If you want to. You want to tell me I'm wrong too? No, I really don't. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, that sounds like a great time. We'll make it happen. All of our music is produced by DJ James Nasty. All the magic cards are produced by Wizards of the Coast. The show is produced by Anthony Parker and me, thinking really hard about magic cards and then speaking into microphones about it. Another great episode in the books, boys, approaching 200. Oh, Case wow. Closed. When's that coming up? This is 190. So okay. Wow. 10 more to 200. What's going to be our 200 spectacular? Um... Uh, <laughs> you got 10 weeks to think about it. Well, you got like nine weeks to okay. think about it. Eight I'll and a half think, weeks to think, think about, about it. it. What you got going on over here? Is this, uh, this, you got a bunch of magic cards laid out. Is this a roto draft? I've got the whole roto draft laid wow. out for this, uh, for the degenerate micro cube. You what should, a, you should stream this. This, this would be like the, the people that love watching a stream of like uh, eggs incubating. Just a live stream of a bunch of cards. <laughs> you're, you're, saying, you're saying this is like checking in on the camera at like exactly, uh, yeah. the eagle, the eagle nest at the zoo <laughs> sure, at the National sure. Zoo or whatever. But it's me slowly laying out the mm -hmm. cards in order for this uh, roto draft. One of the pleasures of having a small cube is you get to do that. On one play mat, I've got a column for each person's deck, and we're in the last row right now. My uh, the last couple of roto drafts I've done, mm -hmm. I really got. I really got pinched, and I got I got pushed sideways into a deck I didn't want that to be in. That happened to me, not the last one, but the one before, and it was frustrating. Happens yeah, to I me mean, every I, time. 
I, I usually think I'm like, I like to think I've done this a lot and I'm pretty okay at like knowing when to back off and when to like just push through. Pretty good at manipulating people in the chat. I mean, honestly, I am very good at that. Yes. <laughs> I don't know what you want from me. Don't listen to Andy. Yes, he is. I don't know what you want from me. I'm a, I'm a people pleaser. Okay. I, I got, I got social skills, but yeah, so I, I, Ended up in a place I didn't really want to be in this draft. Same with the last one I did, though. My last deck was still over 500. I went 5-4 and four with a deck I thought was a disaster in the Neoclassical Cube. So maybe this one will also overperform. We will see. Good luck. I did Powered Cube last night for the first time Ooh. in months. and I was How like, was that for you? I loved it. Well, <laughs> yeah, I I got to do something that I haven't done ever, which was play Library of Alexandria. Ooh, love it. That was a really good time. I had seen Patrick Sullivan just like ranch Cedric Phillips on an episode of uh, The Resleavables with Library. And so he showed me how it's done. And I did my best Pat Sullivan imitation. I have had so much fun playing with Library in the Neoclassical Cube. It is truly a delight. It is so sick. I also got to cast Mox Diamond, cast my second to last card in hand, and then cast Balance on turn two, having played some other stuff on turn one. Power and, cube, baby. Oh, yeah. There's just a two mana discard five or whatever. It's just awesome. You're a sick man. But we love you. Love you too.